In this video, I'm going to show you how to run your own Compound3 liquidation bot in just a few minutes. It's going to be powered by Alchemy, and it's going to use the Transaction History API. And we're going to be able to test out every single arbitrage transaction before we submit it to the blockchain using the Alchemy Transaction Simulation API. With this, we'll be able to see which asset balances change throughout the transaction before we submit it. Finally, we're going to use Alchemy Mine Transaction webhook to send ourselves a notification every time our address submits a transaction to the blockchain. And we're going to do that using AutoCode and SendGrid. Let's get started. The first segment of this workshop, we're going to run through how Compound works and what a liquidation looks like before we go through the code examples where we run a liquidator bot script on our local machine, which could be run in the wild to liquidate positions on compound instances. I'm Adam. I'm the developer relations lead at Compound Labs. I help developers out with their protocol related development projects. So I help out with JavaScript, Solidity, anything you're working on that integrates compound. I also help out with protocol upgrades and governance. You can find me on Twitter and on Discord. So in this presentation, we're going to go through a Compound3 primer in case you're not familiar with the Compound protocol. I'll tell you a little bit how liquidations work before we get started running your own liquidator bot script, which we have a repository for, and we'll walk through that code in a little bit. I work at Compound Labs. We're the authors of the Compound protocol, a protocol made up of several smart contracts running on Ethereum mainnet since 2018. Our mission is to create efficient and algorithmic money markets. What gets me excited to work in the DeFi space is that we author and continue to steward decentralized, free, and open crypto tools for everyone with an internet connection, including the banked, the underbanked, and the unbanked. And if you think about it, anyone on earth with a smartphone and an internet connection can use DeFi and use Compound. Historically, we've seen interest rates for suppliers as high as 15% APY on USDC, as well as all of their supported assets. I love that what we're doing is different from TradFi because DeFi systems like the Compound Protocol are transparent, voluntary systems with public ledgers where code is law. With DeFi, you instead get decentralization and transparency, unlike centralized banking and financial systems. That's what gets me excited to work in DeFi and also in the Ethereum ecosystem. What is the Compound Protocol? It's simply put crypto asset money markets. We refer to it as the Compound Protocol. It runs on Ethereum as well as several L2s, and it's decentralized. The main use case is that it allows users to earn interest on their cryptocurrencies or permissionlessly borrow other cryptocurrencies. So instead of an asset like Ethereum or USDC sitting idle in your wallet, you can supply it to the protocol and earn a varying interest rate. Users can supply crypto collateral and borrow a different crypto asset against their collateral. The interest that suppliers earn is driven by the interest that borrowers pay. Those are the two basic uses of the protocol for everyone, earn interest on crypto or borrow other crypto. The protocol can only support crypto assets that are tokenized on Ethereum or other EVM chains as ERC-20s. It allows suppliers to earn a variable interest rate on their assets, and an individual that uses a dApp like the ones listed on the Compound homepage or their own code can use every feature of the protocol. Developers can build their own apps that use the protocol as interest earning infrastructure. Users or organizations can use interfaces to earn interest, borrow assets, or participate in governance. So use cases we see are crypto wallet applications using the protocol to offer interest earning for their users. Also, any business that holds funds for a period of time, they use the protocol to supply and earn interest for a period to create some income instead of letting those assets sit idle. So here's an example. Let's say you use one of the many interface applications for the protocol. You can supply assets to Compound, and in Compound v3, C tokens are minted for supplying the base asset only, not collateral. And those C tokens are one to one, and they're rebasing. So accounts accrue C tokens for the base asset only automatically over time. And they uh, accrue the varying interest rate. Assets are stored in smart contracts that no individual controls, and there's an on-chain governance system that governs the protocol. C tokens are redeemable at any time. Users can supply for as little as one Ethereum block or EVM block. Interest accrues every block, which is about 12 seconds nowadays. This enables on-demand supplying and redeeming from the protocol. No need to wait for a lockup period. You can earn interest for supplying to the protocol for even just one minute. So this is the concept of over-collateralized borrowing of assets. 
a user must supply a collateral asset before they can borrow, and they can only borrow up to a certain amount of the USD value of their collateral. So the total value of their collateral is always worth more than their total borrow relative to USD. An example of that is you supply a collateral like wrapped Bitcoin or Ether or one of the many others, and a, a borrow is a smaller value of, say, DAI or USDC. And this is set up such that your account is over collateralized. The limit of the borrow depends on the collateral asset. There is a percentage called the collateral factor, which is set for each individual collateral token type by governance. Ether and Rapid Coin have different collateral factors. Those factors are chosen by community members and are selected based on perceived risk of value fluctuation. In order to borrow, a user must supply a supported collateral asset, and they can then borrow an, any asset supported by the protocol. And the borrowed asset will subsequently be held in their wallet with no strings attached. If an account becomes under collateralized, like when the USD value of the collateral goes down too much or too much borrower interest accrues for the account, the user's collateral can be moved to the protocol account when a liquidator performs a liquidation. Supplying only is safer than borrowing. You can't get liquidated if you only supply. There is much less risk involved when a user supplies only and does not borrow. Liquidators keep the protocol safe and collateralized, and they are incentivized to do so. So borrowers that become under collateralized are subject to liquidation of their account. They can lose some or all of their collateral. And due to the autonomous nature of the protocol, the liquidation system is much harsher than traditional finance. There's no negotiating. There's no delinquent repayments allowed with the on-chain code. Let's talk a little bit about liquidations in Compound3. It's only possible to happen to individual accounts that are currently borrowing from the protocol. And that happens when the collateral value goes down uh, relative to USD. There are price feeds that update the protocol every Ethereum block or EVM block of the, the current price of the asset. And if those prices change such that an account is no longer properly collateralized, it can be liquidated. So accounts that stay within the collateral rule requirements cannot be liquidated. And a liquidation can occur if an account's borrow balance goes too high or if the collateral value drops too low. And of course, that's updated by the price feeds. Borrowers can protect their account from liquidation by repaying some or all of their borrow of the base asset or supplying more collateral to support their borrow balance. The liquidation system keeps the protocol solvent. It helps maintain liquidity availability for all other accounts that are using Compound. It disincentivizes outsized risk taken by individual accounts. What exactly happens during a liquidation? The protocol absorbs the entire account that is violating the collateral requirements. So any supplied collateral assets for an account are moved to the protocol's own account. So that account loses all of their collateral. The protocol itself repays the base asset borrow of the account using the protocol's reserves. And if the protocol's reserves dip below the governance set threshold, the absorbed collateral can be sold. So anyone can buy the absorbed collateral at a discount, and they can do that using the base asset. That resulting swap boosts the protocol base asset reserves so that it can perform more liquidations in the future and the remaining balance of the base asset is internally transferred to the liquidated account. So an account that gets liquidated loses all of their collateral and sometimes will end up with some C tokens in their account balance at the end of the liquidation transaction. So let's walk through an example. Let's say Bob supplies one wrap Bitcoin to compound CUSDC V3 on Ethereum mainnet. And at the current time, one wrap Bitcoin is worth $30,000. Bob borrows the maximum allowed amount of USDC based on his collateral, which is 21,000 USDC based on the collateral factor and also the price feed amount for USD relative to USDC. And then sometime later, one wrap Bitcoin falls in value to $27,250. The wrap Bitcoin liquidation factor is 77%. So Bob's collateralization is over 77%. A searcher calls absorb and then buy collateral on Comet in one transaction. Bob's account is then liquidated by Compound3 and the collateral is bought by the searcher at a discount. 
After the liquidation, Bob has 1,362 CUSDC V3 in his account, but lost all of his collateral. So that CUSDC V3 will uh, accrue upward in Bob's account. So the C token is one-to-one -one rebasing. So over 1,362 USDC can be uh, redeemed by Bob after the liquidation occurs. And of course, that, that amount is always going up. What happened to the collateral that was bought by the searcher? The searcher can swap that on a DEX. And of course, there's a discount on the collateral bought from Compound3 so that when the searcher sells the collateral on a DEX, they can pocket some of the difference there. So again, the searchers are incentivized to use the buy collateral method because they could take a cut when they swap on a DEX. And this boosts the protocol's reserves of the base asset so it can perform more liquidations in the future and also have liquidity available for uh, redeemers of C tokens and also borrowers of the base asset. So here's what the Compound3 uh, dashboard will look like for an account that is borrowing but is within the collateral requirements. So this account is not liquidatable. They are safe, but they are approaching the borrow capacity. You can see that by the percentage and the orange line there. Here's an example of an account that is exceeding the borrow capacity, and this account can be liquidated at any moment. We'll see in practice that sometimes accounts that are liquidatable do not get liquidated because the profit is not enough for a searcher to bother with the transaction. Sometimes a gas fee might be too high and it might cause the, the liquidation to not be profitable. So the, the position will be left alone. This one in particular did get liquidated shortly after I took this screenshot. Here are some resources that you can use when you follow along with this workshop. You can head over to docs.alchemy.com to check out all of the APIs provided by Alchemy, as well as the Alchemy SDK documentation, which is also used in the liquidation bot. You can check out docs.compound.finance to learn more about the Compound Smart Contracts, as well as the methods you can call during the liquidation. These are referenced in the code that we'll be going over soon. If you want to join the Alchemy Discord, you can go to discord.com slash infight slash alchemy platform, and you can go ahead and ask questions there in their community Discord. And you can also go to compound.finance slash discord to join the Compound Discord and ask questions about Compound. I hang out in the development channel there, and I help out community developers working on Compound-related projects. If you want to participate in protocol community governance and discussion of integrations, you can head over to www.comp.xyz and learn what's going on in the Compound ecosystem. Next, we're going to go through our liquidation bot. The liquidator script runs perpetually, and it uses Alchemy's APIs. It uses Alchemy Transact to check out the asset changes in a simulated transaction, so we can make sure that our liquidation transaction is profitable before we execute it. We also use Alchemy Webhook, Mine Transaction Notifications. And what this does is anytime our address is used in a transaction, it can send a notification to a uh, webhook. And we're using uh, an API called AutoCode that has a, a webhook listening, and we can execute some arbitrary code that will send us an email via SendGrid upon a successful liquidation. So anytime our address is used, we get a, an email. So if our liquidation bot is running in the background, we can get updated whenever a transaction is sent from our address by our liquidator bot. Next, I'm going to go through the repository on GitHub. You can check out the description of this video to find the link to that GitHub repository. All of this code is open source, and you can follow along and build your own liquidation bot with me. Here's the repository of the Comet liquidator. This can be used for any instance of Comet that runs on any EVM chain. Uh, so we have mainnet ethereum we have polygon arbitrum and base so there are instances of comment on each of those blockchains and the liquidator bot will use a flash swap from uniswap or uh, a flash loan from a balancer pool to liquidate borrows on uh, any of those comment instances once the the borrows are insolvent the liquidator bot will detect that and it will attempt to uh, absorb them into the protocol and then uh, sell off the collateral 
and that selling off the, of the collateral can cause um, an arbitrage where the sender of that transaction could potentially take a profit. So here in the readme, we, we have a little description of how the liquidator bot works. It's powered by Alchemy, uses the Alchemy SDK. And if you have a free Alchemy account API key, you can run the liquidator bot. So there's pretty simple instructions for installing. If you have Node.js, you can install using Yarn and you can create an alert via autocode and SendGrid to send yourself an email anytime a transaction is mined. And you can set that up here. I'll demonstrate that. There are contracts deployed to each blockchain where Comet exists that will uh, facilitate the liquidation process. So all you as an end user need to do with your EOA address, you can submit that to the liquidation bot contract and it would send any leftover assets to the sender of the uh, transaction. So anyone can use that contract. It is publicly verified on each of these chains and it's also in the contracts folder in this repository. So you can deploy it again if you'd like. I'm not going to demonstrate deploying the contract. I'm just going to demonstrate running the liquidation bot. So there are two types of runs for this liquidation bot. You can do a test run or you could do a production run. And with the test run, no transactions are submitted to uh, the mempool or the private mempool. Uh, it is only using the Alchemy Transaction Simulation API and it will show you how much assets get transferred to your address if you were to run that transaction at that specific block height. And in production, uh, you don't have this test run flag, so it's the only thing that's different between uh, these two command line uh, commands to run the bot. I'm going to demonstrate with the test run first, and then I'll uh, run it in production with the uh, production run. So I have this repository cloned to my machine. I'm going to walk through the code with you for a few minutes here. So the majority of the code that we're running through is in the scripts folder. There's a liquidation bot folder, and we have three files. They are TypeScript files, and this is a script that will run on, say, your local machine or your server, and it will just run indefinitely, constantly querying the blockchain for insolvent accounts and also liquidation opportunities. So we have each of the Comet addresses in a map here. So the liquidation bot knows where Comet exists and it can check each of those instances. You of course can modify this and add say the base network addresses. Um, I haven't added them yet. So we have a, a loop that runs every 20 seconds. We have a bunch of environment variables that you saw in the readme. We need to fill these in with, say, the liquidator contract address, the deployment of comment, our private key, which has uh, the gas to run the transaction for liquidations. And we have some logging, shows when the bot starts, creating a reference to the comment address and its contract using hardhat. We're using Sleuth here to do our queries to find out which accounts are insolvent at any block height. This will greatly reduce the number of RPC calls to our Alchemy API key. So Sleuth will uh, create a uh, query that's like a Solidity query. Say you deployed a contract that did a bunch of uh, ETH call operations, and then you can um, aggregate that data into one single JSON RPC call and then we can use that data. So that's what we're using Sleuth for. We're using it to check for all of the insolvent borrower addresses at um, every 20 seconds. So we create a Sleuth query. We create our liquidator contract reference. We get all of the unique addresses from uh, the, the comment contract that are borrowing. We can override this later by just manually specifying addresses, and I'm going to show how to do that later. Here's where we get the underwater borrowers. We're referencing a different file, which I'll run through in a moment. 
And if there are currently any underwater borrowers, we're going to try to liquidate them. And if there are no liquidations occurring at that specific block height, we'll check to see if there's any purchasable collateral because the liquidation process for Comet has two separate steps. And this call will run both of those steps, but this one will only run the uh, purchase collateral part in case there are no uh, accounts that need to be absorbed. So that's the main file of the liquidation bot. We're going to check out these functions here that are in the other file. So if I go to the top, you can see that we're referencing the liquidate underwater borrowers. We're getting the underwater borrowers and we're getting the unique addresses. Uh, we're doing that within the liquidate underwater borrowers script file. So let's check that out. We're making references to our uh, Sleuth API as well as um, our our send transaction file, which I'll run through next. We're getting our comment interface from our contracts, which uh, you need to build in order to use. I'll run through those later. So for our uh, test transactions that don't get submitted to the mempool, we are using uh, gas whales that I found on chain. These addresses just happen to have lots of the gas tokens. So on Polygon, they have lots of Matic. And on Arbitrum and Ethereum mainnet, they have lots of ETH at their addresses. So the transaction can be simulated and have uh, lots of gas to be able to be used. So the transaction will uh, succeed as planned in case you haven't seeded your EOA yet that you want to use in your future liquidation bot initiator address. We have reference to each of the assets in each of the Comet deployments on mainnet, Polygon, and Arbitrum. The liquidation bot will use these. We'll do flash swaps with Uniswap or flash loans with Balancer or Sushi in order to perform the liquidations. Here we have thresholds for liquidations. So if a liquidation is too small, the contract will not attempt to liquidate them. Uh, I've commented this out so we can liquidate even the smallest unprofitable positions. So actually I have one, which is the smallest amount of way for each of these tokens. So uh, this is actually one way of width. So I have this as the minimum amounts that uh, for the liquidation thresholds instead of say one width or 10 USDC like in this reference here. Here we have references to flash loan pools. This is uh, this is uh, defined somewhere else. Where is this defined? Uh, it's defined up here in the addresses. We have pool configs here defined for each of the tokens. So you can add more here, say if you want to add a Uniswap pool or a balancer pool. And if we don't have a pool config, we can't liquidate a, a particular address when they use that collateral. So uh, you can define those here as, however you want. Here's the amount, uh, the max amount of collateral that can be purchased. So you can define these yourself. These are arbitrary. Here's the function to attempt a liquidation. So the first thing we need to do is uh, liquidate the maximum amount of assets and we're going to get the flash loan pool, and we're going to attempt via the on-chain liquidators. So that's a contract that's already deployed. And we're going to submit a transaction from our own EOA. If the liquidation does not succeed, we're just going to try and absorb instead. And we'll actually try smaller and smaller quantities of each of the insolvent accounts until we get it to work. So here's uh, how you attempt the liquidation. You pass the common address, the liquidator address, accounts you want to liquidate, the assets that are collateral that need to be liquidated, the pool configs for Uniswap, Sushi, or Balancer, the maximum amounts of collaterals that you want to have purchased, the flash loan pool token address, the pool fee, and the liquidation threshold, which we defined earlier. 
Here we create and absorb an arbitrage transaction. This is one of the methods on the on-chain liquidator contract. I commented out the gas estimation and I defined my own. I defined really high gas price and limit so that we can liquidate even in solvent positions and hopefully not get front run when we try to liquidate them. So in production, you might want to change this to something more conservative so that uh, you don't have transactions that end up spending more in gas than you would make from the liquidation. So if we're doing a test run, we run against the Alchemy Transact API, uh, and we, we do a test run of that transaction to see if it actually uh, profits. And if it doesn't, you know, we, we can try something else. So this will not submit to the public mempool or the Flashbots mempool. This will only run locally. And if we use Flashbots, we will send a private transaction using Alchemy's private transaction API. And I'll explain the references of send transaction in a little bit. So if we've successfully liquidated, we'll see a message. And if we failed, we'll also see a message in the console. We'll see any errors that come up. Here's our query for getting the unique addresses. So we're using events that are emitted on chain when users uh, borrow the base asset. So we can find the number of borrowers on the common instance, so the withdraw event is what is emitted whenever there is a borrow on chain. So we get all of these withdraw events and we find out which ones have an open borrow. Here we check the purchasable collateral amounts from each comet. So if you're trying to liquidate someone on Polygon USDC, we'll check the uh, collaterals if they're available to be purchased in that specific instance of comet. This function we use to get the number of underwater borrowers, and we get uh, each of their addresses. We get that using the sleuth query, which I'll, I'll show in a moment. Uh, and we can find out which accounts are underwater specifically at any given time, and we uh, push those to an array, and we attempt to liquidate those next. So I'll, I'll show the sleuth query real quick. So we go into contracts, sleuth queries. We have a liquidatable query. So this uses the comment interface, and we pass all of the accounts we want to check, and we're going to run the comment is liquidatable function, which it returns a Boolean for each account, and we're able to aggregate these into one single call instead of doing a bunch of JSON RPC calls. So here we have our sleuth query, which is much more efficient and fast. Let's go back to our liquidate underwater, underwater borrowers function. Okay, so this is where our sleuth query is run and we get an array of addresses that's returned. So here's the attempt to liquidate the underwater borrowers. We're gonna do that for each liquidatable address which we pass from this array. And after we've liquidated an account, we can arbitrage purchasable collateral. So this can run even if you don't liquidate anybody, as long as there's purchasable collateral available, it can be purchased at a discount and it can be sold on a DEX. The last file we're gonna take a look at here for the liquidation bot is the send transaction file. So if we uh, take a look at the top here, we're importing hard hat, ethers, and also the alchemy SDK, which is gonna be how we're going to uh, interact with alchemy's APIs. So we choose a network based on the environment variable that we pass. We have a reference to our Alchemy API key in our environment variables as well, and also our Ethereum private key. So we can create a wallet object using that private key and then send transactions using the Alchemy SDK. So here's the send transaction function. It has two kinds of ways to send transactions. Of course, one being the private transaction method, which you'd use with Flashbots API. Of course, Flashbots is only available on Ethereum mainnet. It's not available on any of the L2 chains. 
So if we're doing this on Polygon, we're going to have to use the public transaction method. So if we're not using Flashbots, we're going to use alchemy.transact.sendTransaction. So we're going to sign that transaction with our private key. And we need to specify a nonce, so we use the Alchemy SDK to get our latest nonce for our Ethereum address. Once we send the transaction, we're going to log the response object so we can see if the transaction is valid and can be broadcasted to the mempool. Here's our simulate transaction with Alchemy API function. So this does not get submitted to the mempool. This type of transaction just runs against the uh, Alchemy node. Uh, you use their API via the SDK. We're going to do simulate asset changes. What this function does is it simulates our transaction and it calculates how much of the base asset will be returned to our EOA trigger address. If the uh, transaction is a successful liquidation and also selling of collateral. So we'll see the response from the API, which is a big uh, JavaScript object that gets logged here. You can comment this out if you don't want to see that. But this line here will show the EOA address that sends the transaction, which will be the gas whale in this situation. And it'll show how much assets are transferred to that address during the transaction. So we'll see an amount of USDC if we're going to liquidate an account on Polygon CUSDC v3. So we'll see that little JavaScript object get logged later once we execute this. Okay, that is the liquidation bot that will run on, say, your local machine or your server. And we're going to quickly take a look at the uh, smart contracts that are referenced in this repository. Remember that you don't need to deploy any of these because there are instances of each of the liquidator contracts deployed to each blockchain. You can check out those addresses in the readme. But if you want, you can always deploy your own instance of on-chain liquidator.sol. So this contract, of course, uses uh, Uniswap for flash loans. Uh, it can also use SushiSwap or Balancer. Here's the absorb and arbitrage function that we uh, call from our liquidation bot script. Of course, we have references to the flash loan callbacks. We can find out how much of an, uh, a collateral is purch purchasable for each instance of Comet. And we can swap the collateral using um, a DEX. We have uh, references for each supported DEX in the contract. We also have Curve. And that's each of the references. There's four different DEXs available. Uniswap, Sushi, Curve, and Balancer. So you can deploy this contract if you want to, but you don't need to. And each of the other files refers to the uh, reference protocols like Compound3, you have Comet, you also have Uniswap, and the ERC20 token. Uh, these are all just needed for the, the smart contract references. So again, you don't need to deploy any of this just for reference in your liquidation bot script. Before we try and run our liquidation bot script, I'm going to set up the Alchemy API transaction mine uh, webhook so we can get an email every time a transaction is mined using our Alchemy API key for uh, submitting transactions. The first thing we want to do is set up our webhook endpoint. So if you haven't already, you can head it to the, over to the Alchemy dashboard 
dashboard.alchemy.com, create an account and sign in. I'm going to create a new Polygon app. Once I have my app set up, I can get my API key. So this is what I'm going to use in uh, as an environment variable when I run my Liquidator bot. So we have our Alchemy docs here where we can check out the references to say things like webhooks or the transact API, the Alchemy SDK, webhooks, each of the things that we're going to be using with our liquidation bot. All right, I'm going to set up my webhook endpoint. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to the Alchemy dashboard and click on data on the left. And I'm going to click on webhooks. And I'm going to use the address activity webhook. So in case my transaction either gets mined or if it doesn't get mined, I can see that activity here. So I can see my failed or succeeded transaction. So I'm going to use this one. I'm going to do create webhook. I'm going to do it for Polygon. And we need to input our webhook URL, which we haven't created yet. So in order to do that, I need to head over to AutoCode and create my app, which will send my email. So here's the AutoCode webpage. Uh, basically, you can make a uh, HTTP server that runs like a, a Node.js server. And whenever that URL gets hit, it can uh, run some arbitrary code that you define there. So we're going to define a SendGrid API request where we're going to send an email to ourselves. So each time that uh, a transaction happens regarding our address, Alchemy will detect that and it'll hit our autocode API endpoint and send us an email. So I'm going to log into my account. So here we are in my free account. I'm going to click on the new web service button here on the right. I'm going to call this Alchemy Notify Endpoint. And I'm going to create a project. OK, so here is our HTTP server. Every time the URL gets hit, this code will execute. So we can test run that by clicking the Run button here at the bottom. We're going to see the output here. We see a, uh, a for loop here, which logs to the console each uh, index of the loop. So we see that the loop output here, and the, re the request is completed. So we're going to replace the code here. So we're going to go back to our repository, and we'll click on the autocode folder here. I have our endpoint in this file here. This is the code that runs when we call that URL. So I'm going to copy this, go back over to autocode, and delete all the code that's in here and paste the new code. So this basically will send a email using the SendGrid API. And what we're going to do is we're going to send the contents of that HTTP request. So it'll be a bunch of JSON data that comes from the Alchemy API. So in order to send that email, we need to set up a SendGrid API key. And that's referenced here. So we haven't set that up quite yet. I will go over to SendGrid and create an API key. So you go to SendGrid.com, and I'm going to sign in. I also have a free account with SendGrid. OK, here is the SendGrid dashboard at app.sendgrid.com. So I'm going to need to do a few things here. First, I'm going to go over to Settings. And you need to set up sender authentication. Basically, this makes it so you can set up a single email address to be the sender in each of your email uh, API requests. So the emails will get sent from this address. You need to authenticate that. So you click here on sender authentication to set that up. I've already set that up. So I'm going to click on API keys, and I'm going to create an API key, which I'm going to save in autocode. So I'll click Create API Key, give it full access. 
and I'll name that API key Alchemy transaction email key, email webhook key. And I'm going to create and view that API key. So we cannot view this API key again. So make sure you keep it safe when you copy it here because you, you can't view it again. All right, now that we've created our API key, we can, come, we can go back over to autocode. So I'm going to go over to environment variables over here on the left. And I'm going to create a new environment variable. I'm going to click the plus button. We're going to call that send grid API key. So we can reference it in our code. I'm going to paste the API key here and save the environment variables. OK, now we have reference to our API key. And we need to set our personalization. So I'm going to set my approved email address, like we, we saw from sender authentication. You need to set this up. So once you authenticate an email address, you can reference those here in your API request JSON body payload. Okay, I'm going to click Save in the bottom right, and I'm going to copy the endpoint URL at the bottom. So this is what I need to reference in my uh, Alchemy address activity endpoint. So here's my webhook URL. I'm going to paste that there. And I'm going to test it by clicking the Test button, and this should trigger an email. So I'm going to go over to my email. We're going to see that we got a new email saying liquidation occurred. So it's got some sample JSON data that comes from Alchemy. This is not for a real transaction. This is just the test one. So uh, you can ignore this. All right, let's refer to our address that we're going to use as our EOA for our liquidator bot. So if we check out the readme, you see there is a ETH PK environment variable. This would be your EOA address. So we're going to get the address for that Ethereum PK. And I'm going to come over here to Ethereum addresses and paste that in. So that's my address that I'm going to use in my liquidator bot. Got to make sure that it has some gas in it so it can create those calls to the on-chain liquidator contract. So I'm going to create this webhook. And now this is running live. So each time a transaction happens involving that Ethereum address on Polygon mainnet, I will get an email. OK, so we're going to try and run our liquidation, liquidation bot right now. We're going to run it in test mode. So we're going to use this test run flag as an environment variable. Uh, I'm going to go over to my console, and I'm going to run. And uh, I'm going to use my. Uh, Ethereum private key that has some gas in it on Polygon mainnet. So that way, when I do run a liquidation transaction for real, I can initialize the transaction because I have gas. Okay, I'm going to run this in test run mode, and we're going to see which accounts are able to be liquidated at this time using the Alchemy Transact API. So we're using transaction simulation. We're going to see asset changes. And this, what, what this will do is we'll, we'll tally up the amount of tokens that will be transferred to our address, and we're going to log them to the console. So I'm going to run the script now. It's going to fetch all of the borrowers on Polygon, and we're going to see if those addresses are liquidatable, and then we'll attempt to liquidate the ones that are. Sleuth is able to check 1,000 addresses at a time, 
And as we can see, there are four pink addresses that can be liquidated. I'm going to scroll back up. So we can see those four addresses here out of the several thousand that we checked using Sleuth. See that there's a few insolvent polygon positions at the moment. And we use the simulate transaction API with Alchemy. You can see that here, this console log here in the send transaction file. And what we did is we, uh, we logged the entire response from the API, which is that big blob of JSON that we saw. And we tallied up the amount of assets that we can get for each of those liquidations. So if I scroll down past all of the token transfers that occurred in this transaction, you could see that the address would be able to get 0.24 USDC for liquidating that account. This is the gas whale that I referenced earlier. So it's the gas whale address because we're, we're doing the simulation. We're just using the gas whale instead of our, our EOA. We'll use our EOA when we go for real. So let's scroll back up and take a look at each of these addresses. So I'm going to copy this address and take a look at it in the compound dashboard. So if we go to app.compound.finance and select the polygon market in the selector here and uh, go to that URL. And then we can do a URL query here and search for an account. And I'm going to set that value equal to this insolvent account. So we can see the dashboard as if we were them. And you can see that this account is borrowing 0 0.0001 USDC. And they have three quarters of one Matic as collateral. So this is a very, very small borrow position, but it can, of course, be liquidated due to the rules in the smart contract. Uh, of course, this wouldn't be profitable. You'll definitely spend more in gas than you would get from this liquidation, or maybe not. Maybe that's not true because we saw that we'd get actually 0.25 USDC. So if we take any other of these addresses and paste them in, we can check out them as well. So this has a slightly larger borrow of 0. 0.88 USDC. And they are using uh, Matic as collateral as well. All right, so I'm going to attempt to liquidate this address on chain. And to do that, I'm actually going to go over to my liquidation bot. I'm going to override the unique addresses. So I'm just going to try and liquidate this one address this time. So I'm going to <clears throat> going to comment out the unique addresses and just provide this one address. So before we try running this, it's very important to note that uh, the address that you have as your ETH PK, you need to have gas in this address in order for the liquidation bot to work. So make sure that you have on Polygon, you have some Matic at this address. So for demonstration purposes, I'm going to do something with my transaction that my liquidation bot generates that is a little different than you would do in real life. I want to make sure that this liquidation occurs and I don't get front run by anyone else watching the Polygon mempool. So I'm going to come over to the liquidate underwater borrower.ts script in the liquidation bot folder. I'm going to go to this function, attempt liquidation via on-chain liquidator. And I'm going to come down here to the populate transaction method call here. So instead of estimating gas like I would normally, I commented out those lines and I defined a very high gas price here. So what I'm hoping for is that my gas price will beat out any other uh, watchers of the mempool that are trying to beat my transaction, even though it is, is not going to be profitable. Uh, as we know, or it might be profitable, but it, it it will be only a few cents. It's really not worth worth your time or effort, honestly. Right? We saw we saw twenty five cents, twenty four cents as the amount you would get, and then however much the matic transaction costs, which might be 
uh, just a few cents as well. Okay, so remember we set this unique address as this one underwater borrower. So we could see they have a very, very small borrow. We're gonna try and liquidate their account. So for this run, I'm going to delete the test run environment variable, and we're gonna run this liquidation bot uh, in production. Let's do it. All right, here's our transaction output. After we submit the transaction, we get this receipt and we log it to the console here. I'm gonna stop the bot for now, and I'm gonna go ahead and check my email. Looks like we've got liquidation occurred emails. We got three emails. We got each of the updates, Alchemy, sent us uh, via our webhook. And we got an email here with a bunch of JSON data that explains what occurred in each of the subtransactions. So if we go over to Polygon Scan and we input the EOA in which we sent the liquidation transaction and check out that address, we see that we called the absorb and arbitrage method on the on-chain liquidator. So if we check out that transaction, we can see that there are a bunch of transfers, and these transfers have to do with uh, flash loaning and also the liquidation process in the Comet contract. So if we go over to the address, we can see that there is now 0.24 USDC in the address, which was transferred from the Comet contract for doing the absorb and buying of collateral. If we go back over to the dashboard for the address in which we liquidated, you could see that there is no longer a balance for the address. And if we look at the transaction history, we can see that there was a liquidation that occurred in the recent transactions. I hope this workshop was helpful to get your own liquidation bot running and understanding how liquidations work on Compound3. Remember, you can always check out the docs at docs.alchemy.com or docs.compound.finance, and you can ask questions in Discord. You can also join the community conversation at www.comp.xyz. Thanks for watching.